needless to say, this is a quality crowd, so uh, I'd like to invite you all to move a little bit closer. Indulge me. Indulge us. Make us feel like we are closer to you. We will have a conversation this way. This way. Come up and um, make us feel warm. Thank you. My name is Carl Hoffman, and I'm the president of Population Services International, PSI. And I am here with this uh, distinguished panel to talk about doing well by doing good, which after all is an underlying theme of the entire presence here at SOCAP. Um, I will introduce each of them briefly. And then uh, we're going to have a bit of a conversation based on questions. But as I introduce them, I'm going to ask them also to just give us a few sentences about their own organization, where they work now, so they can speak in their own words about uh, what they do. First to my immediate right is Jenny Yip, who is a uh, program investment officer with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Jenny came to the Gates Foundation after uh, over a decade at Goldman Sachs and is working on program-related investments at the Gates Foundation. Jenny, do you want to say a word about um, the Gates Foundation and your role there? Sure. Um, I'm sure most of you in the organization knows about the Gates Foundation, but essentially we have three main programs. Uh, global health, which you can think of as upstream development, drug discovery, vaccine discovery, etc. Uh, global development, which encompasses our agriculture, livestock programs, as well as downstream delivery for health products. Um, and then the last program, which is um, U.S. programs focused on domestic education. Thank you. And I should say, full disclosure, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a funder of ours, <laughs> as is USA. So, let me turn second to Wendy Taylor, who is director of the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact at USAID's Global Health Bureau. You know, USAID is probably one of the few institutions that expressly says its mission is to put itself out of business. Um, who among us would actually say that? Prior to that, she worked uh, in the biotech space as a venture capitalist and also at the Office of Management and Budget. Wendy, say a word about where you work now. Uh, great. Um, the tent doesn't fall down on us today. Uh, I, am, I lead what is ca uh, called the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact, which is, uh, as Carl said, and, and we're really a center of excellence that was just recently created to bring more business and marketplace thinking into how we not only develop inter uh, innovations, but how we can accelerate their introduction and scale up in the developing world. So, so we are we are engaging uh, not just in catalyzing new innovations, but also uh, thinking about so bringing in a lot of industry practices uh, and thinking about how we invest, how we um, how we think about business frameworks for for introduction and scaling. So we can talk more about that. Thank you. Next to her is Pony Subaya. Pony is Global Program Leader at PATH and uh, comes to PATH. The PATH is a large international NGO program for accessible technologies and health, program for afford no, appropriate technologies and health, pardon me, based in Seattle, but with offices all over the world, and, uh, and, and a focus on innovation to bring innovative solutions to global health challenges. Uh, Pony came to that role from a long uh, professional involvement with Pfizer, including managing Pfizer's global access program, which is very much about bringing that large multinational into contact with the uh, lowest parts of the health consumer pyramid, I would, I would say. Pony, tell us about your work now at PATH. Great, so I'm the global program leader at PATH um, for drug development. So PATH, as um, mentioned, is a large nonprofit, it's about 1,200 employees, and the focus is on global health and using 
uh, disruptive technologies to meet unmet needs. Now, there are actually five platforms of PAP. Drugs is one of them, but it also includes vaccines development and delivery, as well as technology solutions, for example, cold chain to deliver vaccines, diagnostics, in addition to community-based intervention. So really, um, the whole gamut from research and discovery to really having impact at the field uh, across the value chain. And finally, we have Lara Diakonu who is Vice President of the Health Services Fund at Global Partnerships, which has for 15 years now been doing work uh, in the microenterprise and microfinance fields um, in Latin America, uh, focused on Latin America, but I think also looking elsewhere in the world, if I understand it, um, bringing um, investors here into contact with partners in the developing world for sustainable outcomes. Talk about your work, Laura. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, as mentioned, Global Partnerships is a nonprofit impact investor. Um, we deliver debt, grant, and knowledge capital to social enterprises in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, currently, those social enterprises are principally microfinance institutions and cooperatives. Um, but we're expanding that concept of what a social enterprise is as well in the future. Um, those institutions, um, basically, they serve as existing last mile platforms through which financial services and non-financial services are being delivered to kind of um, marginalized populations um, in the sectors of health, ag enterprise, micro-entrepreneurship and green technology. And I happen to be focused on the health services part of that work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So the context is global health and the changing landscape, the rapidly changing landscape in global health. And each of us, myself included actually, but certainly each of the panelists has uh, an important and unique perspective on how that landscape is changing and the ways in which new partnerships are possible. Traditional government funders, which have been critical to taking global health interventions to scale, are creating new cross-sectoral partnerships these days to solve global health challenges in new ways. Corporations and foundations and impact investors, and we have those represented here on the panel, both in their present incarnations and in their past incarnations, uh, invest in innovative and sustainable and replicable solutions that, when proven attractive and effective, can bring in public funding, which can then provide continuity and take some of these solutions to scale. So I want to talk with this panel about their roles in this new era when the rules are sort of changing in terms of how we fund effective interventions in global health. First, let me start with Jenny and Wendy. So as I mentioned, two funders of my institution as well as many others around the world. Your organizations are both using new forms of partnership across different sectors to create greater impact in global health. What can you tell us from your perspective about what's changed in the global health funding landscape? And what are these new partnerships that are emerging as a result of those changes? And how are those partnerships proving themselves effective? Jenny, can you start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's becoming a very, very large part of what we do, and specifically where I sit on the program-related investments team. Um, just so everybody knows, program-related investments is we essentially make regular debt and equity investments in for-profit companies um, whose business missions closely align with the foundation's charitable goals. So the primary purpose of our investment is to forward the foundation's charitable goals, but we are expected to make a financial return. We frankly, we like it when we make a financial return, obviously. Um, but one way that we've been really structuring these types of partnerships with for-profit companies is in a term called global access. And I think, Pony, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear a lot of the same themes that resonate probably with you. But one way that we think about it is, 
if the Gates Foundation invests in, for example, a biotech company that has a platform technology that can be applicable to multitudes of diseases, the Gates Foundation only cares about a very small subset of those diseases in a small subset of countries. But if we're one of the funders of this technology, what we do is then structure what we call global access. And it essentially means the quick dissemination of information, products, and services to the populations that we care about. So it's actually a contractual term that we use with all of our PRIs to say, we invest in this platform technology. When you apply it to the diseases that we care about, you either have to have price ceilings, you know, price maximums at a certain, uh, depending on the country or whatever it may be. But if you were to apply that technology to cancer in the developed world, then you can kind of use that technology and sell it at whatever price you want and frankly make your millions and billions of dollars. So that kind of structure, it's, it's essentially a cross-subsidization structure. Um, that contractual structure has worked really well with our deals um, and I think it's something that we're going to get continuously sophisticated on and hopefully bring to our other deals as well. So you're leveraging really a global public good through the market potential of new interventions that... Exactly. Exactly. Fascinating. When the you know, USA, particularly under the current administrator's leadership, has done a lot to develop partnerships between public and private sector, um, looking at new business strategies to bring into the development marketplace, talk about how that is changing the role and the way USA looks at its work. Yeah, well, certainly partnerships is, has become a, a core part of what we are doing, and, and we're we are looking to the private sector to help us look beyond our traditional operating models and, and find new solutions. And what's been interesting in the space is really to see uh, industries interests shift as well. I think uh, shifting both in terms of seeing an opportunity to have impact, uh, where in, in global health, uh, we still are seeing 7 million children dying each year and 270,000 moms dying each year. And, and companies are seeing the potential to, to be able to you know, kind of unique ability to innovate and, and have a, a real and sus sustainable impact uh, in those particular areas, and and uh, but they're also seeing the real market opportunity, and and we've I think we've seen the the markets shift uh, even just in the last decade. So uh, looking to emerging markets as a, a new source of of growth, you've got stagnating growth here in Euro U.S. and European markets, and a lot of companies looking to the emerging markets as, as uh, kind of the new growth opportunities, the new frontier, and, and, uh, and Africa is now very much part of that equation in ways that it really wasn't, uh, certainly in the health sector, not too long ago. So the, uh, the healthcare commodity market in Africa is, is poised to, in the next several years to become a $30 billion market and by 2020, a $45 billion market. And, and you've got these um, changing economies where even the healthcare budgets are, are, are rapidly increasing in both low and middle income markets. So it creates this space for this kind of shared opportunity and shared kind of aligned interest between the public and private sector. And, and so with, with, with the companies in terms of where they're engaging, I think they see the opportunity for both kind of short and long term market growth, and they're able to, to align or uh, whether modify, adjust, uh, uh, repackage existing products, but also look to new innovations. So companies are actually licensing technologies that, that address the, more of the bottom of the, the pyramid. Uh, we're seeing companies actually look to new distribution models and recognizing that to actually enter into these markets, they have to look at them differently and they have to, to think about new ways of, of um, you know, using their sales force or, or new ways of distribution. And we're also seeing um, companies actually look at not just delivering products, which they're very good at, but strengthening the health systems because that's critical for them to be able to move their products through these markets. And so uh, kind of shifting, shifting how they operate. And, and in each of those areas, there's, real, there's opportunity for partnerships. Uh, there's opportunities for, for the companies to reduce their risk by partnering with the public sector through NGOs, to reduce the cost, uh, to learn about operating in these markets 
in ways that they perhaps may not know otherwise, and, and even to kind of piggyback off of delivery channels. So it's been a real interesting, I think, shift in how companies are approaching this. So that's an interesting point. It's not just USAID working with corporations, public sector and private sector, but in a way, what you're talking about there is your role making markets, you're creating a space within which other partnerships form. Corporations with NGOs, Absolutely. corporations with host country governments, I assume. Let me ask you though, since, since we're talking about the public sector, public money, and public-private partnerships, do you run into the risk, or how do you manage the risk of picking favorites? Um, of uh, deciding which corporation might be worthy of which partnership when there may be multiple corporations that want to partner in a particular right, space. Right. Well, I mean, we, it, you know, it's something we have to walk that line very carefully. And we have competitions where it's uh, you know, um, uh, goes through a procurement process and 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 it's you know competitive fair process. But we also have mechanisms like our Global Development Alliance where companies can propose ideas to work with us and uh, and we have much more flexibility in how we can can work with the private sector can can uh, can, can partner up in ways that uh, that don't necessarily have to go through a much more sort of open rigorous process pony so path has had a very interesting trajectory over the years it's uh, as you mentioned, done a lot of work in innovation and bringing new technologies to the consumer, to the health consumer in the global health context. And recently, you were a, a, a part of the exciting new partnership that PATH pursued in acquiring One World Health, a, a pharmaceutical company. So bringing that, that capacity inside its own walls. Um, Talk to us about the, the sort of unconventional or non-traditional partnerships that you at PATH are pursuing now as you go about achieving your mission in the developing world. Who do you find yourself working with now that's new and different? Yeah, so I think uh, it's kind of building what um, you, know, you had mentioned about partnerships because I'll give a couple of examples where I think very non-traditional partners were brought together, not just public and private, but also, for example, academics. So our group, uh, which is focused on drug development, is um, uh, in the process of developing, and now we're in the market, of a semi-synthetic artemisinin. Now this is actually a uh, particular compound that is in the what's ma malaria treatment called artemisinin-based combination treatment. This is the gold standard for treating malaria. However, the, this artemisinin used to come from a botanical source. And again, the prices and the supply would go up and down, which meant patients who had malaria didn't always get access to this important medicine. So the Gates Foundation, um, recognizing the need, actually funded, previously One World Health, now PATH, to work as the pro project coordinator and manager of this project. We first started out by working with the University of California, Berkeley. And we looked, and working with them, a new technology was found using um, synthetic biology. And then from there, the baton was handed to a private sector, bio, small biotech called Amaris. And from there, they took it and validated it. And then the next step was then turning the baton to a larger company who can take it and scale it and then distribute it uh, to full-scale industrial capacity. And that was Sanofi Aventis. Now, so it really, as you can see, very different partners that have come together. And it was a 10-year project. And over these 10 years, there was a lot of hurdles. And I would say not always um, smooth sailing, because I think one of the important things we've learned from the different partners coming together is it's really important for different partners to understand each other's agendas, their goals, their pressures, and what has ultimately um, uh, resonated is that we always have the goal uh, in mind, the mission in mind. And I think that helped us get to currently now where we've actually achieved a full-scale production and we're hoping to be able to bring out the semi-synthetic artemisinin-based treatment into the market by the end of the year. But it goes to show that you can bring very non-traditional partners together and you can really um, make a um, end product that ultimately will have global health impact. 
It sounds esoteric. Anybody here ever suffered from malaria? <clears throat> if you were to suffer, if you had the, the misfortune to contract malaria these days, that's what you need. Yeah. <laughs> Artemisin and combined therapy is the frontline treatment for malaria. So this is critically important. Thank you. Um, Laura, impact investing. Uh, it's a, it's a, obviously a theme of SOCAP. It's a relatively new discipline. Uh, in your time practicing this craft, what have, what have you learned at Global Partnerships about what works and what doesn't work in impact investing? What are the ingredients for success in impact investing? And, uh, and do you think that it's really proven itself in the emerging market context? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I think impact investing still means a lot of different things to different people. Um, so the definition is still emerging. I think um, what we've learned over the last several years that we've started to see ourselves in this light is that, um, first of all, there's kind of no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, when we started down this path, um, working on health services um, business models that could really be um, serve uh, thousands and thousands of women with a fundamental essential package of health services sustainably and not rely on donor funding over time. We felt along with our investors that you know if we just kind of cracked the nut and came up with the secret business in a box, it could be replicated and scaled. Um, throughout the world, and I think one thing we've learned is that's certainly not the case, that um, there are some perhaps basic principles to sustainable business models that can deliver essential services to millions of people, but each you know, country context, each organizational context makes um, our impact investment, the reason, the business case for investing very different. We have to measure our impact in different ways depending on what that investment really is about, what we're trying to learn, what we're trying to achieve out of each individual investment. It, it's kind of more of a boutique approach now than what we thought we were embarking on um, several years ago. Um, another thing we've learned is that it really takes different types of capital. Um, to respond appropriately to different types of investment. Um, so several years ago, um, global partnerships kind of came at every impact investment with one tool, and that was debt capital. And over the last couple of years, we've kind of expanded that range of capital, that we're, range of tools that we're bringing to a problem, which is how to expand access to essential services that really make a difference to a certain pop population. Um, and we've expanded it to include now grant capital um, as well as knowledge capital um, because we're recognizing that investments in really early stage pilot models um, are not suitable for kind of a, a debt capital instrument and that we really need to first go in with kind of knowledge capital, partner hand in hand with, with, with our partners to, to really design a business model that we have confidence in, present a business case for investment, and then bring some grant capital to bear that can prove that out. And once it's proven, then we can come behind that with loan capital to kind of expand it and scale it in that context. Um, so those are two things. That I think learned. that's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Jenny, would you agree that, so program-related investments that you're helping to manage at the Gates Foundation, is it, it's a cousin of impact investing, it's related. You said in your remarks that uh, your program-related investment portfolio at Gates is expected to generate a positive financial return. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I mean. Uh, at market rates, above market rates, below market rates? What, what is an acceptable financial return for the Gates, without giving away any secrets here, for Gates program-related investments? Um, I think we shoot for greater than zero. <laughs> um, and I think the other way of framing that exact same question is also being able to assess risk and minimize risk. Um, I think if we were to tell Bill in five years that we generated X returns, he wouldn't necessarily be happy or be, be saying that you did a terrible job because I think how we are assessed is 
how did how well did you predict the risk today in something that's going to happen in five years from now or ten years from now? Because we're not a traditional impact investor. We're not a traditional VC. Um, we're not exactly we're not necessarily looking for an exit opportunity because sometimes our projects do require 15, 20 years. If you're talking about seeding the adjuvant to a potential HIV vaccine, who's to say how much money that's going to generate in the future? So I think for us, um, really, it's it's the idea of calculating risk and calculating it well and balancing that with some of the, the charitable aspects and the social aspects that we expect. So several of us uh, work in the nonprofit environment and all of us have some experience with or in the nonprofit environment. You know, we talk about the Gates Foundation. I mean, uh, Microsoft would easily, I suppose, invest you know, a million dollars or more to test and develop a potentially game-changing new product or intervention, and, um, and has to accept the premise that many times it's going to fail to do that, and it will lose. It's part of its research and development activity. Pfizer obviously spends billions in this regard. But in the nonprofit space, where organizations are expected to deliver, the, to deliver this health impact at scale, there's virtually no tolerance for that sort of risk taking. There's no pool of risk capital that's easily available. So I guess my question to the panel is, you know, is the conventional nonprofit model broken in to, given today's realities? Um, how do we deal with this problem of risk taking among an, in the not for profit space? Wendy, what would you say? Well, I, I mean, I think it's an, I mean, it's an interesting one. I mean, we, it's something we struggle with as well. I, one of the things that I did was spearheaded a, uh, a grand challenge around saving lives at birth, and it was really intended to be a global call for those really innovative, groundbreaking, transformational ideas. In other words, we would have to make some riskier investments to find those. Uh, but we have to be very careful in how we talk about how we invest in more riskier propositions because we're dealing with public funds. Um, uh, but at the same time, we expect you know, only a small portion of those investments that we're making to be wildly successful. We hope everything will be successful. We sure. will work to make sure everything um, gets set on the right foot. But, but we want to be able to create the space where we look for those big groundbreaking ideas. And that does involve some element of, of, of risk failing. taking, it and, and, and there, there may be some failures. In fact, our administrator has, has talked about wanting to do failure summits and, and, and be able to... We'll be there. Okay. We'll be there. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, it's helpful to learn from your failures, and you, you learn probably more from your failures than your successes. So, sure. so we, I think we do have to create that space where it's okay to talk about failures, it's okay to, to you know, present those learnings so that, uh, that we can avoid them in the future. Yeah. So as a, as a donor, I think there's at least, I can say there's, there's some level of, of tolerance for that. That's good. Of course, there may not still be the capital pool available to do the experimentation, but yeah. Pony, what would yeah. you say? Compare yeah. and contrast Pfizer and PATH in that regard, yeah. maybe. I do think the whole industry, but also I think research itself is really evolving. And I think that some of the same questions are being um, I guess uh, addressed both in the private sector and the non-profit non sector in research as such. So I do think that when, um, uh, I think like for example, when we're looking at new products and development, we're looking at ways of how can we kill projects early? Because I think one of the, in, including in the nonprofit, is projects are going on too long. So you may have four projects and you're taking years to kill it. Is there ways we could kill projects early? So there's a lot of research going on is can we have biomarkers? Can, and the other thing I think is um, not only the science, but I think we're also learning, we were talking earlier about how important it is for human designed approach and market research. And I think we're learning, even when you're in early phases of development, go back in the field, is the profile of the product, is it appropriate for what the end user wants? And how do we continue to do that and not wait till a product is seven years down the road before checking with the end user? So I do think that rigor is important and I think it's because it is a, a small, a limited amount of money and how do we effectively use it? And this is where I think, to your point, we have to learn from failures and I think there needs to be more openness about sharing those because I think we help build other things for the future. 
I think that's a great point. Laura, do you feel like global partnerships, you trumpet your failures? Um, I wouldn't say that we trumpet them, <laughs> yes. There has been a lot of uh, conversations about um, expecting that not everything is going to succeed, um, right. although we hope that everything will succeed. But I do, I think that Pony makes a great point in that um, if, you know, to the extent that we can be really, really clear about why we're making the investment to begin with and what success would look like for us, what do we hope to learn from the investment, it's kind of redefining, instead of failure, it's learning, we're always learning. Because um, there will always be, you know, assumptions that are off that are built into models. So as long as we build into our investment that that monitoring, like we we really try to identify what are really the key indicators of success. How do we know that this model is on track? And we monitor that on a quarterly basis with our partners, and in one case, monthly. Um, so that we can catch things early. So if things are really off course, we can know sooner rather than later, oh, this assumption that we made is, looks like it's totally off. What can we do about it to course correct, to hopefully encourage it back towards, on the path towards success, but I think also be clear about when do we say, okay, let's chalk this one up to learning and, and move on to the next one. Let me go back to your earlier comments, which I, I just want you to amplify a little bit. So, you know, when you talk about the different varieties of capital that may be necessary for mm. an impact investment environment, I think, you know, we often might think of, we think of patient capital in that regard, but, but we, are, we might all perhaps be thinking of financial resources. You're pointing out that there's knowledge capital, there's partnership capital, there are all sorts of different ways in which you might be investing yeah. without financial resources being a part of the picture. Yeah, but I mean, it's worth mentioning, I mean, we invest a lot of um, knowledge capital or partnership capital before we even get to the point of investing dollar one of grant in, in the case of my, the investments in the health services fund, I would say Global Partnerships invests almost a full year of staff time and travel, um, like really working with the partner to build their own capacity to really define, to, to make sure they're at the end of the day really owning the investment and they have the management team fully on board and aligned with, everybody's aligned with where we're trying to go. And that's not cheap. And um, that's not something that actually a lot of donors um, are interested in putting their money behind or understand necessarily. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important to signal. But we do think that that's, that's a really important part of kind of success, our success rate at the end of the day is really investing that time and effort up front. Um, yeah, I would, I, can I echo that? Uh, and one of the things that we've noticed with our Saving Lives at Birth program, we have lots of innovators. We choose them. We choose those that we think have the most, uh, you know, greatest chance of, of scaling. Yet we know that scale is one of the yeah. most difficult things. We might have lots of sex, successful pilots, but right. Right. many can really fail to reach scale. And so, so we're looking to invest that kind of additional sort of technical assistance, knowledge capital, and you know, we've created an accelerator to be able to help a lot of our innovators uh, think through pathways to scale, remind them that they should be designing with the end in mind. You don't want to be fixing technical problems at the, mar at the point where you're in the market. You want to uh, fix them in the lab. And just you know, a lot of you know, helping them think through how it's going to be distributed um, at, the, at the earliest stages. Um, but also, we've... Um, we are looking at building up a pipeline of, uh, of innovations, even on the, in the private uh, you know, uh, SMEs. Uh, we've developed uh, an African challenge fund. It's the Health Enterprise Fund. And, and recognizing for a lot of those really, really early stage companies, they need a lot of TA. And so in, you know, in that model, and this is just we're investing uh, with 
with grants uh, now. They're probably, it's too early for, for debt, um, certainly too early for the acumens of the world to step in. And they, and we're putting in you know, almost 50% of our investments going into TA just to make sure that they have that additional. For TA, you mean technical assistance? Technical people, assistance. people right. sitting with them, working with them, teaching, right. uh, so, and transferring I, skills. So I, I think it's critically important to uh, to set many of these enterprises up for success. Right. Yeah, actually, I want to echo that too because. Uh, technical, whatever you want to call it, technical assistance, portfolio management, consultants, time, resources, whatever it may be, um, we actually count that, and that's a criteria in in our investment criteria. So, meaning, if we don't have the time, energy, resources, or expertise to do something, that actually might not be the right time for us to be investing in that company. Because if it fails, we don't have the we don't have anybody to to, to receive the learnings. We don't don't have the ability to then help out our potential portfolio company. So evaluating the portfolio management aspect of it, that could be three or five years in the future today before you make the investment. Yeah. It's actually a huge criteria for us. So maybe even more important than the money is really the it, Honestly, the it is sometimes. Yep. The stewardship requirement. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we've gone through about two-thirds of our time. I think uh, we should invite some questions and see if we can get a conversation going with all of you. Um, in fact, each of you may have to ask a question. <laughs> um, there are mics that are available from Cheyenne and from Bjorn if we need him, but certainly from Cheyenne. Does anybody have a question about uh, any of the things that have been raised so far in this changing landscape in global health? Yes, sir. I'm Joseph Stey. I work for the National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance. We fund grant fund and support mostly student innovation teams, uh, but we are also working with um, Saving Lives at Birth and some other programs to help accelerate innovation. I guess my question is, how, if you're, we, there are incredibly smart, ambitious young uh, entrepreneurs, innovators who we work with, people who are doctors and decided that wasn't enough, I'll get an MBA and I'll also do a startup all at the same time. And many of them are interested in global health. So what do you, when you talk to young innovators, what kinds of opportunities do you see that you wish young innovators were looking at? And what kind of approaches do you recommend that they think about? Pony, can I ask you to take that first? Yeah, I think, um, and in fact, PATH has done that where, you know, they've reached out to like small startup companies and it's turned out to be an amazing product. Like we have this vial monitors that's being used and that started with a very small company of six employees. So I do think that um, uh, you don't know where the ideas come from. So I think that's something philosophy at PATH is encouraging ideas to come through. And so we do have like open forum settings, sometimes like in Seattle, and we're going to start one in San Francisco to be able to bring in people who are interested in some of the same therapeutic areas we're working in, but they may be looking at the problem very differently. So, so I do think getting involved and contacting um, organizations, whether it's PATH or PSI, depending on which part of the value chain there is interest in, I think that is very important. I also think it's very um, important to look at the whatever organization's website to see where they're focusing on and what are some of the challenges they're facing because um, there's so many areas in global health you can go to and you got to make sure you're aligned with the right organization. So coming to PATH for something that may be more important for PSI will it'll just help decrease the time. But I think it, it is needed because we ideas can come from anywhere and I think a fresh perspective is always helpful. Any other? I would just add, I mean, I think what's exciting is uh, in, in, at USAID is we've now brought in this grand challenge model, and it's actually opening up the door to those kinds of innovative ideas and, and kind of giving them a conduit to actually get funding from a big organization like, like USAID. Um, Gates Foundation has its grand challenge program. Canada has a grand challenge program. and. Uh, they tend to fund more of the, the Canadians for some of their, they have a STARS program to, to fund entrepreneurs. So there are different funding sources, but it's still hard, you know, a hard 
pathway to find that funding. And I think just in recent years, we're starting to see um, to better opportunities. Um, it's also just you know, a lot of the universities seem to be aligning themselves around uh, sparking so innovation for uh, global health or innovation for development, and that's, I think, opening up the door for possibilities for, for some of you know, the young students, entrepreneurs, to find these, um, you know, these new solutions to these um, seemingly intractable development challenges. And, and through our grand challenge, uh, we have numerous examples where the ideas have actually come from students. They've been student projects that they did their senior year, and, and now they're actually turning into something that's yeah. you're getting scaled countrywide and saving um, you know, hundreds and thousands of lives or even in their earliest stage. So it's, it's very exciting to see what young entrepreneurs are, are coming up with and, and finding their, their path into these larger development spaces. I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair to also answer that question from my perspective, if you don't mind, which is that, that energy that comes from young entrepreneurs and innovators and all the people who want to move into global health is really exciting for all the practitioners. But, but you know, many of the challenges in global health are really not ones susceptible to a new technological innovation. Uh, some of the simplest, most effective cost-effective ways to save lives exist. And what's really needed is something that winds up feeling and sounding unsexy, yep. but it is simply process improvement. It's simply figuring out how to deliver that last mile or that last 100 yards. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I think for anybody who's passionate about global health, you don't ever want to leave those who may not have a technological bent thinking that only, the only way to innovate in this space is through technology, because a lot of it is just getting things into the hands of people who need them. Yeah. Can I add to that? Yes. Um, so I was going to say, we're, we're really not in the business of inventing new things or coming up with new technologies. Our challenge really is exactly that, finding ways to deliver what's already tried and true and maybe has lost its sex appeal out there in the market, but the fact is that millions of people still don't have access to those really basic essential services and products. And a lot of that has to do with the information gap to even know what it is that right. they're experiencing or that they can manage a certain condition from their home or that they can't even prevent it. So I think what we're seeing is that there still is this kind of rural access frontier that remains to be solved. So to the extent that there's innovation around you know, how people receive basic information, um, to educate them about how to handle a situation or when, because right now a lot of people in rural areas simply self-medicate or don't go to a doctor or receive any medicines at all because they just simply don't have access or don't know what it is that they have. Um, systems, I mean, to the extent that there are IT solutions to help, you know, if there is a rural pharmacy for, to, to distribute products and services, to bring down the costs in that. Um, and to just deliver really essential services that for whatever reason the public sector has simply not figured out. They don't have the capacity yet to be everywhere in their, in their, in their countries. And so for that reason, there are private sector providers delivering basic health services, but they haven't yet figured out how to turn a profit off of the really rural remote communities. So there's this white space where um, there does need to be innovation to kind of push forward that near market solution frontier in terms of rural access. And the other big one that I think is on the frontier is chronic disease in the developing world that hasn't risen to the level of sexiness in terms of international community funding really flowing into this yet. And yet it, we're seeing an epidemic in terms of um, folks, clients of microfinance institutions testing off the charts for, in terms of risk factors for, for, to develop chronic disease in the future, and this will become a huge um, burden, uh, cost burden for governments in the future. So there's a lot of innovating to be done around, around that, because I think chronic disease is still seen largely as a developed country issue. Great point. You had a question. Somebody had a question. Hi, my question was, there's often a lot of criticism in global health about the role of aid organizations or other organizations 
bringing in first world solutions um, and often allowing governments off the hook in terms of meeting halfway in solving these issues. And I was wondering to what extent your organizations really focus on also capacity building and holding govern local governments accountable in putting their resources to meet you and help solve problems in a more sustainable manner. So the trade-off between impact and system strengthening, really. Jenny, would you like to give your perspective on that? Yeah, and, and I think the Gates Foundation is a little bit unique in that sense because we do have some clout in the international community to be able to do all those things. So, um, you know, the head of our global development, um, Dr. Chris Elias, who actually came from PATH, is actually spending a lot of his time with ministries of health or whatever it may be, um, making sure that these, uh, these or governments or government organizations are getting held accountable. Um, but that's a very tough thing to do because you're trying to tread the very, very fine line between telling somebody what to do and saying, oh, you need to do X, Y, and Z for polio or whatever it may be, um, and frankly offending them so that they close off the borders and then you don't get to do anything. Um, so it's a lot of diplomacy, it's a lot of partnerships, it's a lot of working together as opposed to, you know, the Gates Foundation telling you, country, what to do. So. Any other thoughts, Pony? Sure. I mean, I, I would just add it. I'm, country ownership is actually a big part of how we engage with with countries, and 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 so it's also not about just coming in and sort of imposing the sort of west west view of of all the various things that need to be done. And countries need to actually sort of set their own development agendas. And it, and I think the reality in the development space is that because the economies of these countries are shifting so rapidly, overseas development assistance as a whole is becoming such a smaller and smaller part of the sort of our, our sphere of influence is, is, is diminishing rapidly. And so, so our ability to even kind of shape where countries are spending their money is, is changing. And, and you know, that's certainly true in India. Um, and, and, and as these economies you know, boosted up, it you know, will be true in many other parts of, of Africa. And so, so I think our relationships with, with countries are changing. And so, so you know, country ownership dominates how we interact. Um, uh, but we also do look for things like crowding out and want to make sure when we're investing, it's not getting sort of the, the country investments are not sort of drawing up and moving elsewhere. You want to um, supplement and not right. plant. Right, right. Pony, were you going to say something? Yeah, so I think um, just adding on that, I think early in, the par early in development, I think you have to be able to bring in the government. So it's not a top-down approach. I think one example, like at PATH, is the meningitis vaccine. So it was very, it's very successful. About 100 million people have been vaccinated. But I think the, one of the reasons for the success was the idea was generated but involved lots of different partners from global organizations and WHO who gave the policy and the credibility to it. But then partnering with the manufacturing, vaccine manufacturer in India, the Serum Institute of India, and then working with the governments in Africa to really roll out the program. So it really was a partnership from the beginning. It wasn't like a top-down approach. And your point point is right, because if that partnership doesn't come early, sometimes it's very easy for some of the ministries of health to just to depend on the global fund, or to, and they don't really take the baton. And I think involving them right from the beginning and showing them the proof that it is having health outcomes and is going to impact their civilian population and, and have impact on their society, I think has helped move them along. And I think that's one example of where it has worked in the right direction. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the best operating environment for an international NGO is when the host government takes ownership of the program, yeah. directs resources, be it its own or coming from outside, and sets objectives and priorities. But the reality is that's very rare. It's very rare, unfortunately. Other questions or comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Avik Pal from iCure. Um, we've seen uh, many small, young entrepreneurs doing uh, different things, uh, but the end goal is the same. For example, they're providing primary health care, or they're providing you know, AIDS eradication, or they're providing, you know, but in small pockets, some in Tanzania, some in Kenya, some in Bangladesh, you know, India, somewhere. 
in your capacity as an umbrella organization, uh, you know, a much bigger organization, and may, maybe you have incubated a bunch, many of these are being associated. How do you connect the dots? And instead of them trying to kind of penetrate into distribution models and stuff, they all come together and, and you know, make a much bigger impact than they could have otherwise. So global networks, global systems, how do we aim for global systemic change rather than just point to point? Anybody? Um, so for me, coming relatively new to the nonprofit sector from the private sector, that was also kind of, um, for me, surprising, because just like in the private sector, there was also some amount of co competition, not necessarily the collaboration that was optimal between NGOs. But I think there are certain partners that it seems to be being more and more facilitated, whether it's by USAID or Gates Foundation, is let's not fund two different groups to do the same thing. How can we capitalize on each other's strengths? I think it's a good one. I don't think we're there yet, but I feel the journey has started where because there's limited funding, we have to capitalize on strengths and then really look at the impact. And, and so, I, I mean, I think we're starting the journey, but I don't yeah, think I would we're say there the yet. marketplace is imposing yeah. that on us yeah, now. Okay. It really is. Yeah. The era of limitless resources is perhaps behind us, yeah. at least for a while. Yeah, I would like to say that we don't fund two organizations doing the same thing, but we sometimes do. Um, but we're quite cognizant of those things, um, and I think there's internal processes we have in place, for example, so that we're not, you know, reinventing the wheel in every country. Um, I think there's always a there's always an issue of pilotitis, and I said this in an earlier panel. Um, you know, it's very easy to make something work with 10 villages or, you know, 10 small groups, but how do you actually scale that to 10 countries? Like, that's the holy grail, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Disagreements? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Brad Michaels with Social Lab. And I am mindful, of course, we are at SOCAP. So in addition to thinking uh, within the global health uh, market, do you also see opportunities for uh, broadening and innovating and looking at new partnerships with some of the groups that are represented here that may be outside the global health uh, sphere currently. So partnerships outside health, great question. Laura, what would you say? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think a big one that we've been thinking about, it's not necessarily a different sector, um, but I think speaking to an earlier comment, kind of the idea of how, do, how does the public sector become more of an active partner um, with the private sector partners that we support on the ground, I think is a, would be a really great development to see actually the public sector emerge as more of kind of the systems designer and coordinator and regulator, but um, embracing the fact that in order to have a countrywide health system that works, you really need actors from all the sectors um, to make that happen. That, um, the public sector simply isn't enough and maybe shouldn't be enough um, to do that. Um, I do think, you know, w one thing we come up with um, against a lot of times is um, kind of that combination of the socially minded organization with the business skills. So kind of changing the mindset. Um, I don't know if this is what you're speaking yes. to, but um, we, a lot of our knowledge capital really has to do with kind of changing the mindset of how these programs are being conceived and managed, that they're more than a social project, it's actually a business. Um, so to the extent that those kinds of skills can be brought from other sectors into the health sector as social enterprises emerge and grow and scale, I think that would be really helpful, particularly the marketing as a skill. Um, we've seen it time and time again being kind of a real hang-up that we run up against in terms of how do you reach thousands of 
women living in remote areas with the same standard message and the same standard services, the same information, that really takes some marketing expertise that um, your average NGO founded for global health or a health project doesn't think maybe is the most important skill to hire on. So that's another area. Wendy? I would add, and, and I think it's sort of the, the sort of the, the big obvious one with this crowd is, is you know, how do we leverage the, the billions that are poised to to be directed into impact investing? How do we leverage that for health? And and are there ways that we can come up with creative, innovative finance structures to to um, be able to bring impact investing in to to further our development goals? Uh, you know, certainly, we can play a role in building a pipeline of innovations to, to come up with investable opportunities. Uh, we can play a role in sort of de-risking those investments, which is something that, that, uh, that we do. Yeah. But, but finding a way to tap into that, um, to that additional capital uh, is, I think, uh, you know, would be a very exciting uh, place to be and something we spend a good amount of time thinking about. Um, but also for the entrepreneurs in the room, uh, thinking about where there are cross-sectoral spaces. So when we think about health, um, you know, where energy and health may intersect. So education, um, education, so, um, yeah. or, or education on the you know, on the energy side. Thinking about the cold chain as as being an important piece of of uh, healthcare delivery and and where new innovations on the on you know, energy sector can play a role. Uh, so there, I think there's lots of interesting cross sectoral spaces uh, for innovation and and need some creative minds to, to and, and and our funding doesn't always support those. Sort of intersecting spaces. I think the Gates Foundation is probably better at doing that. We, we get funded in these silos, and so it's, right. it's a bit harder to, to fund outside of health. But I think there's a lot of room for, for, um, for innovation there as well. Yeah. We're all victims of silos. We're all victims of silos. <laughs> yeah. One more question? Yes. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Athel Young, and I am actually a recent college grad and um, worked a lot with a, an organization called GlobeMed, which is a national uh, university-based organization where chapters work with different grassroots organizations to address global health inequities. Um, a lot of what we do kind of focuses on developing this leadership pipeline for students and people who hopefully will go in to work in global health and development. And I was wondering what sort of advice or even expectations you had for these uh, future leaders who will need to be able to innovate and to be able to create and build partnerships. A great question to close the panel on. So forward thinking. Laura, advice to future leaders. What should they be looking at? What should they be preparing for? Um, wow. So while well, it was mentioned as a key challenge, the silo effect that we have currently. So I think to the extent that um, your vision is really multidisciplinary and yet client focused. So always keeping in mind kind of what is the end goal, but not limiting yourself to any one discipline or kind of skill set I think is going to be more and more important and those fundamental relationship skills are um, not necessarily learnable in school but I think um, the, sometimes make the difference between success and failure um, in our work because you do have to bridge cultures, you do have to employ diplomacy, um, there's a lot of um, persuasion, yet, you know, passing the ownership, and so those types of um, political savvy skills are really key. Pony, what would you say? Advice to future leaders. I think, um, first, I think having the diversity of thinking is going to be very important, I think, especially as the world gets smaller. And I do think people who have experiences on the ground is going to be very critical. I think um, traditionally it has been leaders coming from the more the developed countries. And I do think now many organizations are really looking to increase leadership presence in the ground 
with local, local um, up and coming leaders, not just from the developed world. And I think that's going to be very critical. I do think leaders are going to come women, different, different experiences, different backgrounds are all going to be very critical. And I do think listening is going to be very, very critical. I think there's been a lot of learnings in the aid world of not listening enough. So we bring products that end up becoming failures. And I think that's going to be a critical, critical skill. Great. Wendy? Um, I would just say to, to, to believe and, and to, to you know that your ideas can have a tremendous impact. And you know, we, we are seeing uh, young entrepreneurs really be able to play a significant role in, in development. And we need those new ideas and new ways of thinking and, and the belief that small ideas can actually have, have tremendous impact. So, so I applaud you and wish you luck. It's, it's, uh, it would, um, you're absolutely needed, so keep it up. Jenny? The last thing I'd say is just perseverance. Um, I think it's a very, very complicated problem we're trying to solve, and it's not enough just to have one great idea. You're going to need that one great idea and hanging on to why you believe in that great idea for months, years, if not even longer. Um, so, so perseverance is, is definitely the key. Great. Well, we've got 16 seconds left to go. No, we're over by 16 seconds. So I, think, <laughs> I thank the panel. I thank you all. Uh, thanks for your questions. Thank you very much.